Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Chapter 41 The first week of their return was soon gone. The second it began, it was the last of the regiment's stay in Maryton, and all the young ladies in the neighbourhood were dropping apace. The dejection was almost universal. The elder Miss Bennets alone were still able to eat, drink, and sleep, and pursue the usual course of their employments. Very frequently were they approached for this insensibility by Kitty and Lydia, whose own misery was extreme, and whose could not comprehend such hard hardness in any of the family. "'Good heaven, what is to become of us? What are we to do?' would they often exclaim in the bitterness of woe. "'How can you be smiling so, Lizzie?' Their affectionate mother shared all their grief, and she remembered what she herself had endured on a similar occasion five and twenty years ago. "'I am sure,' said she, "'I cried for two days altogether when Colonel Miller's regiment went away. I thought I should have broke my heart. I am sure it shall break mine,' said Lydia. "'If one of you could but go to Brighton,' observed Mrs. Bennet. "'Oh, yes, if I could go to Brighton, but Papa is so disagreeable. A little sea-bathing would set me up forever.' "'And my aunt Phillips is short. it would do a great de- deal of good,' added Kitty. "'Such were the kind lamentations surrounding the perpetually through the Longbourn house. "'Elizabeth tried to be diverted by them, but all the sense of pleasure was lost in shame, "'and she felt anew the justice of Mr. Darcy's objections, "'and never had she before been so much disposed to pardon his interference in the views of his friend. "'But the gloom of Lydia's prospect was shortly cleared away, "'for she received an invitation from Mrs. Foster, the wife of the colonel, and... To the re- of the regiment to accompany her to Brighton. This invaluable friend was a good, very good young woman and very lately married. A resemblance in good humour and good spirits had recommended her to L- and Lydia to each other, and out of three months' acquaintance had there been in- intimate too. The rapture of Lydia on this occasion, her adoration of Mrs. Foster, and the delight of Mrs. Bennet, and the mortification of Kitty, are scarcely to be described. Wholly inattentive to her sister's feelings, Lydia flew about the house in restless ecstasy, calling for everyone's congratulations and laughing and talking with more violence than ever, while the luckless Kitty continued in the parlour, repining at her fate in terms of unreasonable as her accent was peevish. "'I cannot see why Mrs. Foster should not ask me as well as Lydia,' she, she, said she. "'Though I am not her particular friend, I have just as much right to be asked as she, and far too I am two years older.' In vain did Elizabeth attempt to make her reasonable, and Jane to make her resigned. As for Elizabeth herself, this invitation was so far from exciting in the same feelings as in her mother and Lydia, that she considered it as the death warrant of all possibility of common sense, and for the latter, and the detestable as such a step, must make her were it known. She could not help secretly advising her father would not let her go. She represented to him all the proprieties of Lydia's general behaviour, and the little advantage which she could derive from the friendship of such a woman as Mrs. Forrester, and the probability of her being yet more imprudent with such companion at Brighton, where the temptations must be greater than at home. He heard her attentively, and then said, "'Lydia will never be easy till she has exposed herself in some public place or other. We can never expect her to do with a little expense or inconvenience to her family as under the present circumstances.' If you are aware, said Elizabeth, of the very great disadvantage to us all which must arise from the public notice of Lydia's unguarded and imprudent manner, nay, which has already arisen from it, I am sure you would judge differently in the affair. Already arisen, repeated Mr. Bennet. What is she frightened away from some of you lovers? Poor little Lizzie, but do not be cast down. Such squeamish youths cannot bear to be connected with the little absurd absurdity. You are not quite a regret. Come, let me see this list of pitiful fellows who has been kept aloof by Lydia's folly. "'Indeed, you are mistaken. I have no such inquiries to resent. "'It is not of peculiar, but of general evils which I am now complaining. "'Our importance, our respectability in the world, "'must be affected by the wild vol- volatility and assurance "'and disdain of all restraint which mark Lydia's character. "'Excuse me, for I must speak plainly. "'If you, my dear father, will not take the trouble of checking her exuberant spirits "'and of teaching her the present pursuits are not to be the business of her life, "'she will soon be beyond the reach of amendment.' Her character will be fixed, and she will, will at sixteen be the most determined flirt that ever made herself and her family ridiculous. A flirt, too, in the worst and meanest degree of flirtation, without any attraction beyond youth and intolerable person, and from ignorance and emptiness and of her mind, wholly unable to ward off any portion of that universal contempt which her rage for admiration will excite. In this danger, Kitty is also comprehended, for she will follow wherever Lydia leads. Vain, ignorant, idle, and absolutely uncontrolled, oh, my dear father, can you suppose it possible that they will not be censured and despised wherever they are known, and that their sisters will not be often involved in the disgrace? 
Mr. Bennet saw that her whole heart was in subject, and affectionately taking her hand, said in reply, Do not make yourself uneasy, my love. Wherever you and Jane are known, you must be respected and valued. You will not appear any less advantage for having a couple of, or may I say, three very silly sisters. We shall have no peace at Longbourn if Lydia does not go to Brighton. Let her go. Colonel Forrester is a sensible man, and will keep her out of any real mischief. She is luckily too poor to be an object of prey to anybody. At Brighton she will be less of importance, even as a common flirt, than she has been here. The officers will find even a woman better worth of their notice. Let us hope, therefore, that her being there may teach her of her own insignificance. At any rate, she cannot grow many degrees worse without authorizing us to lock her up for the rest of her life. With this answer, Elizabeth was forced to be content, but her own opinion continued the same. She had left him disappointed and sorry. It was not in her nature, however, to increase her vexations by dwelling on them. She was confident in having performed her duty and to fret over unavoidable events of argument by them by anxiety and was no part of her disposition. Had Lydia and her mother known the substance of her con conference with her father, their indignation would have hardly found expression in their united vo volubility. In Lydia's imagination, a visit to Brighton comprised every possibility of earthly happiness. She saw with the creative eye of fancy the streets of the, that gay bathing place covered with officers. She saw herself the object of attention to tens and to scores of them at present unknown. She saw all the glories of the camp, its tents stretched forth in beauteous uniformity of lines, crowded with the young and gay and dazzling with scarlet, and to complete the view, she saw herself seated beneath a tent, tenderly flirting with at least six officers at once. Had she known that her sisters sought to tear her from such prospects and such realities as these, what would have been her sensations? They could have been understood only by her mother, who might have felt nearly the same. Lydia's going to Brighton was all that consoled her for the melancholy conviction of her husband's never intending to go there himself. But they were entirely ignorant of what had passed, and their raptures continued at their little intermission to the very day of Lydia's leaving home. Elizabeth was now to see Mr. Wickham for the last time, having been frequently in company with him since her return. Agitation was pretty well over, and the agitations of formerly partiality entirely so. She had even learnt to detect, in the very gentleness which had first delighted her, an affection and a sameness to disgust and weary. In his present behaviour to herself, moreover, she had a fresh source of a displeasure for the inclination he soon testified of renewing those attentions which had marked marked the early part of their acquaintance, could only serve after what had since passed to provoke her. She lost all concern for him in finding herself thus selected as the object of such idle and frivolous gallantry, and while she steadily repressed it, could not but feel the reproof contained in his believing that however long and for whatever cause his intentions had been withdrawn, her vanity would be gratified and her preference secured at any time by their renewal. On the very last day of the regiment's remaining in Maryton, he dined with others and the officers at Longbourn, and so little was Elizabeth disposed to part of him in good humour, and that on his making some inquiry as to the manner in which her time had passed at Hunsford, she mentioned Colonel Fitzwilliams and Mr. Darcy's having both spent three weeks at Rosings, and asked him if he were acquainted with the former. He looked surprised, displeased, alarmed, but with a moment's recollection and returning a smile, replied that he had formerly seen him often, and after observing that he was a very gentlemanlike man, asked her how she liked him. Her answer was warmly in his favour, with the air of indifference. As soon he soon afterwards added, "How long did you say he stayed? Who was at Rosings? Nearly three weeks. And you saw him frequently? Yes, almost every day. His manners are dare very different from his cousins. Yes, very different. But I think Mister Darcy improves on acquaintance. Indeed," cried Wickham with a look which did not escape her. And pray may I ask? But checking himself, he added in a gayer tone, "Is it an address that he improves?" He has he designed to add aught of civility to his ordinary style, for I dare not hope, he continued in a lower and more serious tone, that he has improved in essentials. Oh no, said Elizabeth, in essentials I believe he is very much what he ever was. While she spoke, Wickham looked as if scarcely knowing whether to rejoice over her words or to distrust their meaning. There was something in her countenance which made him listen with an apprehensive and anxious attention while she added, when I said that while he improved on acquaintance, I did not mean that he, either his mind or manners were in a state of improvement, but that from knowing him better, his disposition was better understood. Wickham's alarm now appeared in a heightened complexion and agitated look. For a few minutes he was silent, till shaking off his embarrassment, he turned to her again with the gentlest of accents. 
You, who so well know my feelings towards Mr. Darcy, will readily comprehend how sincerely I must rejoice that he is wise enough to assume that even the appearance of what is right, his pride in that direction, must be of service, if not to himself, to many others, for it must deter him from such foul misconduct as I have suffered by. I only fear that the sort of cautiousness to you which I imagine has been alluding is merely adopted on his visits to his aunt, of wh whose good opinion and judgment he stands much in awe. His fear of her has always operated. I know when they were together it was a good deal to be imputed to his wish of forwarding the match with Mr. Bow, which I am certain he is very much at heart. Elizabeth could not repress a smile at this, but she answered only by a slight inclination of the head. She saw that he wanted to engage her on the old subject of his grievances, and she was in no humour to indulge him. The rest of the evening passed with the appearance on his side of usual cheerfulness, but with no farther attempt to distinguish Elizabeth, and they parted at last with mutual civility and possibly a mutual desire of never meeting again. When the party broke up, Lydia returned with Mrs. Foster, Forrester to Meryton, from whence they were to set out early in the morning. The separation between her and her family was rather noisy than pathetic. Kitty was the only one who shed tears, but she did not weep from vexation and envy. Mrs. Bennet was diffuse in her good wishes for the felicity of her daughter, and impressive in her injunctions that which would never be an opportunity of enjoying herself as much as possible, advice which there was every reason to believe would be attended to, and in the glamorous happiness of Lydia herself in bidding farewell the more gentle adieu of her sisters were uttered without being heard.